How are you? Hi, good to be here. Nice to have you. So am, am I right about that, that I think you, you guys sort of have a really great work ethic. You're, you're, you go and you go and you go. And I think the pandemic might've been a bit of a, you know, a bit of a, a quick stop. Yeah. Well, when you grow up in Buffalo, you know, you that sort of work ethic is, is really drilled into your head from, you know, the second you're crawling, uh, you know, and, um, but the pandemic, yeah, it was kind of a quick stop. And it was, it was strange because I had recorded, <clears throat> excuse me, I had recorded one of the songs for a compilation and then the pandemic hit. And I, and I really, I was just, I don't know what made me think this, but it was just like, no, you need to make a whole record. You need to make a whole Christmas record. And, um, and we just had so much fun doing it, even though we had to do it, it was, we had to do it in this very strange sort of, you know, bunker like mentality. What do you mean? Uh, to keep everybody safe. Everybody had to be COVID tested and, and, uh, we were pretty, you know, straight with everybody. Like, you know, you go, go to back to your hotel or to room service, do whatever, you know what I mean? But, um, and we kind of tried to minimize, you know, exposure to other people, which was, kind of difficult when you're bringing in horn players and string players and singers and you know it, but we did it you know so far you know no no uh covid that's from, all from doing the album it's always good is, it's always when you get when you get a record and the body count is low that's always <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know Unless you're like a metal band. Yeah, unless you're a metal band, then it's different. You want it high. I think that another thing that people don't, unless you're the band Body Count, the, the thing that people don't often understand about Christmas records, because I just don't think it, it, it would matter to them, is you have to, you have to make them usually in the summer. Like you have to make oh, yeah. them in a very non-Christmas time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, it was interesting because we, we found this really old, cool studio. It's kind of like a vintage retro kind of hipster studio in Los Angeles in Boyle Heights. And uh, it's a place called Palomino. And it just had, it's like you walk in the door and it's like 1968, you know, it's really just pretty incredible. And um, so we were, we were able to give the album kind of a more authentic sound. We wanted it to sound like the albums that we grew up listening to. And um like what? Like what, what? What were they? What were your sort of guiding lights? Well, for me, of course, it's all the, all the Rat Pack stuff. Louis Prima is also one of my favorites um, because it was like this trashy sort of swingy music, you know. And uh, I didn't I didn't want the recordings to be pristine, so we did a lot of we did a lot of uh, research on how they used to record when they only had like you know two tracks or whatever, four tracks. And uh, figured out how to do it that way, so so it was so it was pretty interesting. It's pretty amazing the records they were able to make back then. You know, like these, these you know they, they were going in on tape. You know, again like one or two, one or two tracks, and they were making some really beautiful stuff. Yeah, you had to know what you were doing. I mean, I, like <clears throat> we work in the digital realm so much now for convenience' sake, and and but I you know sometimes I mean it has its downside. I mean it's exposed. It's the digital world, Pro Tools and all that, and doing everything on computers. It's sort of dumbed the process down to the point where, you know, well, I, I, I don't sing well, fix it. You know, it's like you really, you know, when you do a record in an old school fashion, it's like you really, you got to work at it. You got to have people in there that actually really know how to play. So... And, and it's a, you, you can certainly get that from the record. We're going to listen to a little bit of one a song off the record. This is called You Ain't Getting Nothing. You're only eight years old. I caught you drinking beer. You paint the cat red and you pierce the dog's ear. You ain't getting nothing this year. I truly feel for your current circumstance. You think I'm giving in. You ain't got a chance. You know I love you, but you drive me insane. That is Goo Goo Dolls with You Ain't Getting Nothing. I feel like that could have been in like the Grinch that stole Christmas. Like that's a great little Grinchy kind of Christmas song. Yeah, yeah, that was that was kind of the idea. It's like, 
you know, it's, it's just something now that I have a three-year-old, it's like something that I think anybody with kids can relate to, you know, is the, the threat of, of Santa not showing up is like really potent, you know, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, at least it worked for me when I was a kid. How is that writing Christmas songs? I mean, like there's such a, there's such a great, um, catalog of them and you do a lot of these standards. I can only imagine when you sit down to write a Christmas song. You, you... Well, I mean, you can never, I can never expect it to be as good as what other people have done. You know, I mean, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Like, and, and what I also learned doing these classic Christmas songs is the 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 musicianship and and just the 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 writing um you know the vocal melodies are just so insane all over the place it's just you know so it 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 took a lot of work to get the vocals right because it because man it was just these bizarre intervals and things you know I, i think because they're christmas songs we tend to put them in a little like a little box and we go like, oh yeah, well, those are Christmas songs, whatever. But when you listen to like White Christmas or like I'll Be Home for Christmas, these are like some of the best pop songwriting I've ever heard that we don't, you know, they're up there with like Be My Baby and Good Vibrations and, you know, like that, that we don't, we don't consider because they're Christmas songs, you know? Right, exactly. And it's like, you know, we also learned there aren't as many Christmas songs as you might think. Uh, <laughs> there's just, there's just a hundred different versions of like 30 songs. Um, you know, but that's why we wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, get into doing the Tom Petty song, which was just because Tom Petty is, he's probably my ultimate, you know, like if I was going to worship uh, a songwriter, a rock star, I think it would be Tom Petty before anybody else. I can hear that in your music. I can hear that. You know, there's like, there's, there's rock, there's an edge, but there's still a sweetness. There's a pop, there's a leanness to the music, you know? Yeah. You know, he... I, what I might admire most about Tom Petty's body of work, I mean, he came in, he started out, you know, he came in, you have the original stuff that they did. Um, then you have the stuff that he did with Dave Stewart, which had a completely different bent on it. I mean, you know, electric sitars and synthesizers. And, um, and that was a big risk for him to take, but he did it. And he did it really, really well. And then all the stuff that he did with Jeff Lynn and, uh, you know, Full Moon Fever and the Traveling Wilburys and all that. It was just amazing. He just kept evolving and changing. And then, and then the stuff that he did with Rick Rubin. Do you, t- do you take and, inspiration from that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, it's just Tom Petty was just so cool. Like, <laughs> as, long as, he was, as long as he was Tom Petty, you know, yeah. you're like, wow. Well, he's got a synth play in there. Oh, and a sitar. Wow, this song is really great. It's just that he's such a great writer, you know? Yeah. Did you get to meet him? I did. I did. We actually got to have a really nice conversation for about a half hour, you know, 40 minutes, just kind of, you know, talking about songwriting and things like that. And he was, he was, uh, he was just really cool, man. You got to tell me him. about it. You got to tell me. I mean, I don't want you to tell anything you don't want to tell, but can you tell me, I mean, like, can you tell me about meeting Tom Petty? Where were you? I was at, uh, it was right after 9-11, and uh, we were doing, um, we were doing a show on uh, the CBS network. I think it was CBS. We were in the CBS building anyway. And, uh, you know, it's just a lot of actors and musicians and that come together, um, you know, and just doing songs and then, you know, asking people to help out because it's what was needed at the time. But we were all, we were all backstage together. It was just like, it was like, you know, you know, Mike Myers and Sylvester Stallone and Brad Pitt and Tom Petty. And and then there's me, (laughs) (laughs) you know, so I decided, you know, I was going to gravitate toward the other musicians because, you know, yeah, but uh, but uh, yeah, it was just it was just an interesting conversation because he was just so cool and laid back, and he was very he was just nice about it. You yeah. know? He must have heard your songs. I mean, you guys were everywhere, 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 everywhere on the radio in two thousand one. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. He he knew who I was, which was nice. He yeah. knew who I was, and that felt good because a lot of times you meet uh, 
you know, you know, that cliche about don't ever meet your heroes, you know? <laughs> and, um, yeah, I've met a few of my heroes and it was like pretty shocking or, or disappointing. Yeah. And, um, but he was, he was awesome, man. Does, no. does that make you take into consideration how you are when people meet you? Like people who are, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's like, yeah, the thing is people automatically assume that you're going to be a certain way, you know? And it's like, look, man, I'm just a, I'm just a guy playing in a band and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that I can pay my mortgage doing it. Uh you know, it doesn't make me better than anybody else. It just makes me luckier. You know? Well, you, you've written some really incredible songs, and I, I wouldn't be able to let you go without uh, talking about one of the big songs that really has been the soundtrack to a lot of our lives here. And I think you know what one it's going to be. Take a listen. And I don't want the world to see me Because I don't think that they'd understand When everything's made to be So I want to give a bit of background here. That is Phoebe Bridgers and Maggie Rogers covering an incredible Goo Goo Dolls song called Iris. John Resnick of the Goo Goo Dolls is my guest right now. Phoebe Bridgers promised her Twitter followers that if Donald Trump lost the presidential election, she would cover that song. That ended up giving Phoebe and Maggie their first number one song on the digital ch- uh, sales chart. Have you, have you heard it yet? Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous what they did with it. You know, I was going to say, when, when it started, I didn't expect to hear their version of it. And, uh, and I was just like, wow, I could really hit that high note back then. <laughs> not, not so much anymore. But, but uh, yeah, they did a gorgeous version of the song. And they, and they raised a lot of money, apparently, for, you know. And, um, and I'm grateful that they, that they did it. And, um, yeah, you know, that song cast a very long shadow. But it also, I mean, like, that's one of those songs, that song is so much bigger than this band will ever be. The song is bigger than the band. And, um, and that's cool, you know. But I, I'm grateful that that song came into my life because it, it truly changed my life. When you say it came into my life, it's, it makes it sound like it came from somewhere else. Like, I mean, I don't want to get all woo-woo about Go it. Go ahead. But... Woo-woo it up, man. Woo-woo it up. I mean, because, you know, I, I can't claim all the responsibility for it, wherever it comes from. I mean, there's moments where it just feels like it's coming in the top of your head and you're like, and it comes out of your hands and your mouth and, and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Where were you? Where did that come from? I don't know whether it was something that's being put together in your subconscious or, or whether, you know, the universe is tipping you in that direction or whatever. But there's definitely, it feels like there's something helping. Where, where, where were you when that one came in? <laughs> Iris? Yeah. I was, living in a, I was living in a hotel in Los Angeles, uh, you know, waiting for my divorce to be final. And, um, and uh, yeah, I was invited by the music supervisor to come check out like an early cut of the movie. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I knew what my job was. Because they showed me the scene, and uh, I always felt like I I always felt writing for film to me was um, easier because I had my subject matter right in front of me. The story is right there. The lines are being fed to me. So you know, <clears throat> you set the tone with the music, and then and then work on uh, you know what would I say in that situation. And that was really was my focus. You know, what would I say to this woman? Because I'm so in love with her, but I, I can't really touch her. I can't, I can't, you know, in order to feel all the good things of being human, I'm going to have to feel all the bad things too. And um, that's what really drew me to the story, you know. Did you know when you wrote it? Did you know? Did I know it was going to be a hit? Yeah. No, I was... I was. Uh, I just wanted to be on a soundtrack with U uh, two, Alanis Morissette, and uh, and Peter Gabriel. I just wanted to see my name on the same album as them. You know. When, so, when, when did you know it was getting out of control? Like, when did you know it was like? I think this is this is because Iris is one of those 
Iris is like, hey, Judish. Like, Iris is one of the, those songs, you know? Yeah. Well, it would, um, you know, I, I try not to pay attention to the charts and stuff because it just makes me crazy. And I'm always like, well, it's number, number nine. Why isn't it number eight? You know, um, so, so I tried to avoid checking out the charts. Um, but I still do. But, um, yeah, when, when somebody told me, hey, this is, this, is, this is the number one song in the country, you know? And I was like, whoa. Which is a weird feeling for a kid, a guy, who started out as a kid in the back of a beat-up van, you know, sleeping on top of all our equipment and, you know, sleeping on people's floors and, uh, you know, playing tiny little clubs uh, to 50 people for years. You know, that, that, and I felt it was weird because after we had sort of, we had a hit with the song Name, Mm. uh, before that, before Iris, um, not nearly as big, but then Iris came out and I, I, you know, I said to Robbie, I'm like, well, I guess we're turning a corner here. You know, Um, I don't think there's any way to go back. And then we were like, okay, fine. Let's see where this takes us. And, uh, you know, this is where it took us. It was, it was, what was really strange about it as well was that, you know, as soon as Name and Iris came out, we took a lot of crap. Because we were, we were like the, not indie rock, but sort of underground band Darling, sweethearts, whatever. Yeah, you, know? you guys were like a, you guys were like a hardcore band. You were like a punk band. You were, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. At first, yeah. But it's like, I mean, you know, I started to grow up, and I wanted to play other things. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, yeah, we started to take a lot of crap from critics, and there was almost this kind of this bit of a dark cloud, almost like shame that I, I'm like, Ugh, I felt like I did something wrong. Really? And, uh, yeah. It took me a little while to get my head straight. After that, because it's like, honestly, I should have been, I should have been so happy, but it's like, you know, once the entire world knows who you are, that's when all the hate starts to come your way. And I wasn't prepared for that. What is, what is that? If, only if you want to tell me here, but what does that dark cloud look like? Depression. Yeah. You know, uh, drinking too much. Yeah. Uh, sort of isolating yourself from a lot of people that you knew. Because people people get weird, yeah. you know, when you have a little bit of success. Yeah. And and your true that's when you learn who your true friends are, because they're actually happy for you. I feel like something happened when the people who heard that song when they were perhaps younger than your fan base was at the time were hearing it on the radio when they grew up. Like I feel like there's a re- a renewed appreciation for that song in the last ten years. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean I by that? I got a lump in my throat, you know, when I when I saw a, a video of Twenty One Pilots doing it, yeah, and people singing it, and like, it was just like, wow, because I know my attitude about guys twenty years, well, well my attitude when I was a young man, uh, my attitude towards towards almost all musicians who were twenty twenty five years older than us was, you know, disdain. Yeah. We're the new breed. Yeah. You know? We're gonna sweep this old stuff away and like create the new sound. And um you know, and to hear a band who who's very popular and very and very good, you know, do a song, do one of our songs, it it felt it it was I was humbled by it. There was a best selling yeah. novel in Canada called When Everything Feels Like the Movies. Like yeah. in there it's 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 sort of transcended, you know? It really has sort of transcended. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, I'm grateful for that. So I, I'll, I'll play it every show for the rest of my life, as long as I'm allowed to play. Good, because there's a world where you don't do that, right? There's a world where you, you know, there's a world where you go, we, we both know musicians who have had hits who don't want to go near them, you know? Yeah, and I always feel like, I don't know if I can say this, you can bleep me, but I always feel like there's such ungrateful b- <laughs> You know, because it's like people pay a hundred bucks to come and see you play and you're not going to play some of the songs that they want to hear. It's like, come on, man. You know, really in, in, 
in a certain aspect after you create the art and then you go out and you're, and you're touring, you know, it becomes a commercial venture. And, and I'm basically, I feel my perspective of it is that I'm providing a service in yeah. a way. Do you think you have that perspective because you're from Buffalo because of the way you were brought up? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, you know, and I remember all the advice that I got from a guy who owned the only club in Buffalo where we could get a gig, the Continental, a guy named Bud Burke, who was super instrumental in bringing all the original punk bands to Buffalo and all the post-punk bands into a city like Buffalo because he would take the risk. And um, I remember him saying to me the, for before the first tour we went on, because I used to work in the bar, and he said, and the night before I left, he said to me, anytime you come back, there's, there's always going to be a job here for you. And then he said, it doesn't matter if you're playing in front of five people or 5,000. He's like, give it all you got. And then he gave me a hundred dollar bill and told me to tuck it in my shoe and said, don't spend this until you're in real trouble. And, uh, did you ever spend it? I probably spent it. I was like, hey, I got a hundred bucks. Let's get beer. You know? <laughs> but it was like 21, you know? So, so, <laughs> but, um, that was a beautiful thing. That was, that was one of those moments, you know, where it was like, wow, to, you know, for someone to have faith in what you're doing, you know, I gotta tell you, man, like not everyone gets that story that I'm so grateful you told me that, yeah, you know, you struggle and then you get this huge international hit. It causes you anguish. It causes you sadness. It causes you to spiral. And then you get that other redemption where you, that you find out how much your music, music means to people. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad for you and thank you for it. No, oh, thank you, man. Thank you. I, you know, I'm really, uh, I'm happy I got a chance to talk to you and I hope you have a great holiday. Me too. I can't wait. You're going to play Slide. We have we have a version of you playing Slide. Tell me about yeah, this. This is another yeah. song that was a huge hit. Tell, tell me something about this song I might not know. Uh, that you guys might not know. Uh, if you really listen to the lyrics, they're they're pretty dark. <laughs> they're actually pretty dark, and it's ba the song is basically about uh, a teenage couple and um, who get pregnant, and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. Because, and it's very much a reflection of the way I grew up in a very uh, ethnic Catholic environment. You know, we grew up Polish Catholic and it was, it was everything. The entire culture surrounded, like, you know, was the center of the culture. There was the church. And, um, you know, we all went to Catholic school and we all went to church all the time. And, and it was very much a, a, a story about a young couple who gets pregnant and they can't figure out what they're going to do. You know, do you want to get married or do you want to run away with me? What do you want to do? Like, let's get out of here. Or, you know, um, and what choices do we have? And it was very much a song about pressure from every angle. It's, 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 it still holds up. And thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it.